Hi, um, so everyone, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, this discussion group is part of our series on South Asian philosophy. If you're interested in other groups as well, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for Oxford Public Philosophy and we also have a website with the same name. So today we have with us Professor Sharni Mitro who works at the intersection of performance and politics. Her interest in political theater stems from her years as an actor with Delhi based street theater groups, uh, theater group uh, Jono Nakhdunwanch. Um, she's currently revising towards publication um, her manuscript Contesting Capital, A History of Political Theater in Post-Colonial Delhi, which interrogates the ever-shifting, adapting expressions of political theater under different configurations of power. Professor Mitra has taught courses on Indian, Asian, and non-Western performances, as well as modern theater history and performance studies. Her teaching bridges the gap between the global North and South, putting into dialogue the histories of Western realism with classical folk, stylized avant-garde, and improvised forms from around the world. She actively embraces the scholar practitioner activist role, encouraging the connections between pedagogy and practice. Before coming to Barnard, she taught at Brown and New York University in the United States and conducted lectures and theater workshops in Jawaharlal Nehru University, Jamia Mila University, Delhi University in India. Uh, among her current projects is her collaboration with a group of sex workers in Sangli, Maharashtra, India, examining the ways in which they use theater for their political mobilization. I'll just pass on to Shaini to uh, get us started. Thank you, Shruta Kriti, and uh, thank you all. It is, um, it is, I was really thinking about it this morning. It's one of the strange benefits of our Zoom world that I am able to sort of chat with all of you. And even if I can't see your faces and be in the same room, uh, it really is wonderful to feel that um, so many people are sort of interested in listening. Um, and I think this, this format of the public philosophy lectures and discussions is, I think a really great way of engaging. So thank you all for being here. I know that Zoom is not always the most exciting forum. Uh, so what I will try and do today, I think, is just uh, some of you may have um, gotten the readings that I sent along, and I will, you know, uh, use those as a starting point. But really think about. I think this was an interesting moment for me to look back at all the work I've been doing and thinking, well, is there a philosophy behind this? Or what are what are the different philosophies that we can think of that shape political theater and practice in India? So I'll try and give you sort of an overview, both historically of how it's been practiced, uh, and I will be specifically talking about Delhi, uh, but also thinking about sort of contemporary protest and performance and trying to see are the what are the antecedents what are the uh, examples that we can get that help us understand the contemporary moment as well right um, i'm going to try and not talk at you the whole time so i thought it would be fun for us to look at some pictures together and maybe we'll um sort of make our way through those images and hopefully some video too right um Again, feel free to uh, you know turn on or off your cameras as you wish. I would love to see all of you during the discussion section. Uh, so yeah, with that, I think what we'll start with is, um, give me one second. So maybe we'll save the videos for uh, the end. And Shruti, I would really appreciate if you did some timekeeping. And if I'm going on too long, feel free to flag me. Okay, so I was really thinking about what is then, if we had to crystallize this relationship of political theater to philosophy, what would we sort of foreground in that discussion, right? And to me, fundamentally, the operative word here is sort of uh, for political theater is space. How do you activate space? How do you access space? And really, who has the right to take up space? And so part of my project, and I keep laughing about this, which is uh, when I had been doing my dissertation way back as a doctoral student, I was very focused on sort of theater history, right? And going into people's archives, doing interviews, trying to get to people, uh, you know, often in their 80s and 90s at that point, uh, trying to sort of uh, have some kind of oral narratives of their work in all of these different theaters I was interested in. 
Uh, and so it was a fairly, I want to say, conventional theater history project. But then after I was done, it really is the telescoping out of that and, you know, looking at the uh, woods and not just the trees and realizing that, well, I'm actually talking about the city of Delhi, right? Who, and for those of you, um, hold on, my, oh, this is interesting. Sorry, I'm going to exit out and in because my computer seems to be frozen. Give me one second. I'm going to sort of reshare. Sorry about that. Hopefully that will fix it. Maybe we start with this and then we'll see. Technology, I mean, we tried our best. We did a little run and then there will always, it will always come get you. Okay, um, so yes, yeah, so I am specifically talking about Delhi because that is my experience. Uh, and I will be talking shortly about the street theater company I was a part of. Uh, and that's also where a lot of my research work is. But I think we can take these sets of principles that I talk about in terms of one city, the capital city in India, and apply it really to a variety of places, right? Certainly from my own research, and I was, when Shruti was reading out my uh, bio, I was thinking, wow, I really should update that. Uh, but more and more, um, you know, uh, my focus has really been on sort of transnational projects and comparative projects. What are sort of US political environments and protests uh, sort of uh, tropes and how do they operate in India? What what kinds of give and take and networks do we see within these kinds of um, practices? Uh, but the case study here really is Delhi. And these are, you know, it's kind of fun. I just, I, I wish I were a better cartographer or even have more sort of evolved uh, knowledge of it. But just to even look at Delhi, uh, I found these maps from 1924, 62, this very fun sort of abstract map from 2015. And it's immediately obvious that Delhi has massively grown, right? From a colonial city, it really becomes uh, the British capital of India only in 1908. And there's a whole sort of process of the transfer of the capital from Calcutta to sort of the administrative heart in Delhi. Uh, and the British very consciously set it apart from the Mughal sort of capital and the different cities that have sort of sedimented themselves over centuries in Delhi. And so Delhi has this very particular spatial geography where there's the, the sort of older parts of Delhi, we literally call it Old Delhi, and the capital takes on the name New Delhi it sets itself up as this new city. But when they set it up, uh, when, you know, first there were the civil lines, then there was the parliament houses and uh, the president's house, Rashtrapati Bhavan, uh, and then the different ministries, and uh, there's a planned part of the city that is Luton's Delhi. That didn't used to be uh, populated or recited. It, it was really a new imagining, a new spatial imagination of this city. And since then, in the 70 years, Delhi has just expanded in every possible direction, right? And to the point where it has recently been designated the, as the national capital um, region, but there are various suburbs, Noida and Gurugram, or what we used to call Gurgaon, being sort of the two biggest ones that are sort of connected through highways and uh, now sort of metro and other transportation links. Uh, that's where a lot of these multinational companies, et cetera, et cetera, have set up um, their shop. And so Delhi has just expanded in every possible direction. But the fascinating thing here, and, uh, you know, it's the lower map is that the cultural institutions of Delhi have a very definite uh, circumscribed sort of um, uh, spatial sort of um, 
placement. And Delhi, if you go to Luton's Delhi, there are really these roundabouts and, you know, streets going off of it. I don't know, like before maps, I don't know how we remembered, you know, before Google Maps, like just how to, which street connects to what. But the idea was that the National School of Drama, the Katha Kendra, the Sangeet Nadak Academy, which is the Academy for Performing Arts, the Sahityakala Academy, the Academy for Literature, it's all concentrated in around this one circle, which... Um, bottom here which is Mundi house right and you could see that the museums the Shriram center for performing arts uh the lalit kala academy which is the fine arts academy they were all concentrated around this one um roundabout traffic roundabout and that roundabout if you look at the top right over here that is sort of very close to as i'm saying this administrative hub of the city Right, this new governmental sort of enclave that Luton's Delhi imagines, um, and part of the project, I would say, of political theater, has been to reimagine this speciality. Right. Uh, before I go on, Hayden, did you have a question? And I would love to take it now, or we can wait. Um, I think that there's just like a technological problem with trying to connect with sound. So. Uh, no, no problem at all. And and feel free to, you know, uh, we've been doing this for a while, so I'll keep an eye on the chat if you want to ask questions as I'm going along. Um, or also, of course, as you are doing, feel free to use the um, hand raise function. Okay, so my project, as I said, is started off historically, and uh, the essay you read by Safdar Hashmi gives you some of that background. I start really around independence and I think about, okay, here's this new city. It's announcing itself as New Delhi, right? That's how we sort of designate the capital of India, not as Delhi, but New Delhi. Uh, and so what happens there? And we see almost uh, sort of through a history of the 20th century and maybe a little bit before, but we really see political theater come into its own uh, in the shape we understand it uh, as coming out of the independence struggle and longer progressive movements, right? So there was the Progressive Writers Association, et cetera, et cetera. So there's something called the Indian People's Theater Association or IPTA, which really brings together, you know, writers, lyricists, artists, musicians, actors, and it really is, it starts off, um, you know, in the 1940s, 42, but there are again, like sort of prior meetings of that. And they have this model of wherever you are in the country, you get together, sometimes a particular play will make its way along the different um, branches or shakas, um, if you will. But, uh, you know, there was this idea of regional troops. Here's this new country. There are all of these new languages uh, or not new languages, but sort of uh, new projects of nationalism through different languages. Um, and so there were IPTA branches everywhere. There's, there was a Bombay IPTA, a Calcutta IPTA, an Agra IPTA, a Patna IPTA. They're all sort of versions of this across the country. And they performed on the streets. They performed whatever they could get. And the performances, you know, ranged from scripted theater to um, songs was very popular. People would take out singing troops and travel neighborhoods. Uh, there were sometimes sort of folk forms associated with it, but they weren't traditional performances. The India has several, several sort of traditional folk or longer standing performance um, uh, traditions. But these were very consciously sort of this uh, hybrid model of taking new messages or new writing or new songs and using older formats, right? So, but it was very, very eclectic. Uh, and so here we see, and this is someone, it was actually kind of wonderful. I got to interview the lady who's sitting on top of the uh, this yeah. like just we would travel through the uh, the neighborhoods, and this is around uh, Red Fort, which is the old part of the city, um, and people would just come, 
and they would you know they'd be interested because we would have the Indian flag we would be singing songs they were able to sort of collect audiences in that way uh, and this was part very consciously I think uh, in the 50s a part of the nation building project uh, the Indian People's Theatre Association and it it's, it would have these conferences and Jawaharlal Nehru who was then um, India's first prime minister he would give addresses to at these conferences he was really trying to sort of imagine also this idea of um, I am greatly interested in the development of a people's theater in India right who is the people who is India what is theater um, and as we see you know they had the IPTA had its own magazine it was still doing shows and having conferences it had this every man kind of aesthetic right indian people's theater association where people here is uh really the new citizen is every man every person uh and broadly under a socialist rubric if you will right so there's a lot of themes as we see in all of these images really of peasants of farmers Often workers' rights are talked about. Um, if you don't uh, recognize, uh, uh, I don't know, I should move this. Um, at the top over here is someone who would make woodcuts and he became very prominent, Chitta Prashad. And uh, he has, you know, sort of images of dancing uh, tribals and other indigenous people. And so they were really very, very eclectic in their influences. Uh, but I would say it was broadly oriented to sort of a working class uh, kind of aesthetic. Uh, then, you know, now we're getting into sort of their big gaps in this, but IPTA, and there are many, many reasons why, but IPTA as a force in Indian political performance and theater more broadly starts to wane and sort of dissipate by the mid 60s. Uh, my personal thesis for why this happens is because this is also that cluster that I showed you uh, around Mundy House. This is the time that the buildings and the institutions of Mundy House start to be founded. And it's really very rapid. From if you look at mid 1950s to mid 1960s, you have all of these national academies that get established, right? National Academy for the Performing Arts, for literature, the National School of Drama, um, the Dance Academy, Gatha Kendra, et cetera, et cetera. So there, the new nation goes towards nationalization through institution building. And you can see that here there is this already this conflict between a, a version of theater or performance that accesses people where they are, right? Again, this image of somebody on, sitting on top of a car in Red Fort, which is extremely sort of densely um, populated, versus, you know, a beautifully constructed, well-planned, lush sort of um, city center, which becomes the cultural hub around uh, Mundy House, right? And so we see that process in the 50s and 60s, when we think about the theatrical landscape of Delhi, if you will. Uh, Someone I spend a lot of time talking about is this director called Habib Tanvir, and he becomes very prominent. He develops his own style of theater called Naya Theater or New Theater. But he did something very interesting in the 1950s. While this process of nation building through institutionalization was happening, he has this play called Agra Bazaar, literally the bazaar, the market of Agra. And the first time it's staged is in 1954, but really this play gets performed over the next 50 years. And as you can imagine, the ensemble, the cast keeps shifting, the, even the shape of the play itself keeps shifting um, over a 50 year period. And that was very much Habib Tanvir's sort of style as he would, uh, nothing would have a script, it would grow, it would move in directions depending on time and really the play becomes a living object in that sense. But what Habib Tanbir did was stage this play at an industrial area 
Okhla industrial area. And now if you go to Delhi, Okhla is sort of considered South Delhi and, you know, um, uh, sort of very posh around Jamia Millia Islamia. The university is not too far from it. Uh, but back then, 1950s, it was really an outpost. Think of an industrial outpost, right? Uh, but he takes people from that neighborhood and he stages this play called The Bazaar, which is celebrating the pedestrian life of the market. And the very, you know, um, uh, let's say lyrical and capricious through line of that play was the stories and the poems of a particular uh, poet called Nazir Akbar Abadi. And the premise of the play is this is a poet who is well loved. Everybody knows his poems on the streets, vendors sing it, etc., uh, etc., et but he never published. Right? So the, the play itself, if you really sort of look at it meta theatrically, is a meditation on oral literature and oral performance uh, sort of practices that live on without sort of taking uh, definite shape. Uh, and so that's part of that undercurrent of trying to imagine a people's space, if you will, still carries forward, but it becomes in some senses more divergent. There is a very prominent nationalist and nationalized uh, sort of uh, practice of theater, which is tied to institutions and auditoriums, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then there's this informal strain of theater, which becomes sort of political theater uh, in India or in Delhi. Uh, the group that I talk about and which uh, some of you might have briefly read about is called Jana Natya Manch, People's Theater Forum or People's Theater Front. Right? Again, we see sort of... Uh, the invocation of people of uh, as a collective, as an every man's kind of identity. Um, and they start off, they're, you know, they're, as many of you, I hope, uh, I don't know if there are any theater kids in this audience, but uh, even loosely, once you graduate, you will be getting together with people you went to university with and starting to do things, right? Starting to st uh, book clubs, reading groups, uh, theater companies, so this was a group of students who graduated from Delhi University in um, the late 60s, early 70s, and they got together wanting to make plays. And as ha would happen then, they started with renting out small auditoria. They tried finding uh, writers that they liked or plays that they were interested in. And this is, you know, a process we are all familiar with. This is still broadly how university theater and cultural activities function, right? You find a little space that you can afford, you somehow get together a group of people and you rehearse together and then you stage it. But uh, A, again, as I think I, I can speak from New York, but I'm sure the UK faces this as well. It's expensive, right? It is hard for you to rent rehearsal space or auditorial space, and if you do, maybe you can have a play run for three days, four days, but the kind of capital investment you would need to stage a big production or to really have this long running theme is outside of the scope of sort of uh, the average uh, interested theater practitioner, right? Uh, so much of cultural activity depends on fundraising one way or the other, either state sponsored, corporate sponsored, or not for profit or individual philanthropy, however it is. And in India, this period became particularly sort of difficult because in 1975, the Indian emergency was declared by then president, uh, then prime minister Indira Gandhi. 75 to 77 was a period of national emergency, suspension of all civil rights. Uh, and there was, you know, and you might come across accounts of this in different forms, but uh, there was obviously a lot of Persecution and fear of persecution of any kind of political opposition, right? Uh, a lot of activists went underground. There was a real sort of lull in um, cultural activity. And when this group re-emerges from the national, and this is, um, uh, this is actually during the emergency, there were very, very few performances, 
but I found and I found this fascinating um, because partly because I myself am Bengali, but that you would have cultural groups under the guise of, you know, religious festivals or carnivals or other rituals, which would often do little plays. And sometimes these plays were very, very political, right? But they could make the political critique or the anti-establishment critique during emergency because they were sort of uh, under the guise of loosely religious cultural activity. So it's, I, I won't say that all political activity suspended um, during emergency, but it was very interesting to shape some of this talk. But going back to the theater company I was talking about, Jen Natyamanj, when they come out of emergency, they realize they're really decimated in terms of funds, right? They just no longer have the capacity to even sort of raise minimal rental fees for any of these places. And it's almost by chance that they stumble upon this form that they later start calling street theater. If we can't perform in auditoria, we can still perform. We can perform in the streets, right? And looking back about 40 years ago now, a little over 40, uh, the regimens of, again, the right to public space were different. Um, you didn't need as many permits. You could sort of have, you had far less surveillance technologies and re recording technologies. So you could show up and do things. And then, you know, if nothing else, you could sort of pack up and run. Uh, but there was very much that aesthetic in the beginning of this guerrilla-ish theater. And this is not unique to India at all, right? In the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, theater companies across the world uh, partly because of the massive sort of student struggles of the 1960s and sort of that era, but really theater companies across the world were sort of stumbling in their own way into versions of this kind of practice, right? Where you get out of the big buildings and you go where people are. And fundamentally to me, that is, you know, when we think of philosophy as praxis, that is the practice of political theater. You go find people where they are and you don't charge. Right? If the play is good, they're going to watch it. And if it's not, they're going to leave because they have other things to do. But the philosophy is one of open access, one of democratizing space, right? Um, hold on. Move this around. Their first play, and this still continues to be performed, is called Machine. And it's about 17 minutes long. And it's really a very, uh, you know, sort of uh, a pastiche sketch kind of play, which it talks about here's this machine, and the actors get together in the middle and they form this machine, and parts of the machine keep breaking down. Um, the owner of the factory has an investment in it. The local politician wants the machine up and running because it's good for him. The guy who's security in charge of like guarding the factory, he's like, oh my God, how did this break down? I don't want it to sort of, um, uh, I don't want to be blamed for its failure. And then there's the worker who actually runs the machine and knows it, right? And so it's this very sort of allegorical, quick play about the machine and who runs the machine and what is the machine. And the apocryphal story of how this play comes to be and becomes this thing is that they wrote it overnight, Sattar Hashmi and somebody, um, one of his colleagues, uh, and they took it to a big trade union rally. And this was massive sort of stadium full of trade union delegates from all parts of the country. All of the representatives from these labor unions were there. And here was this bunch of, you know, not really college students, but very young actors being like, hey, can we perform this? And they're like, sure, sure, sure. But then it was literally that at the end of a big speech, someone's like, fine, go ahead and perform it, right? Uh, and then they're like, we'll only be 20 minutes. We're not, you know. And so they go to the bottom of this stadium and start performing and people are leaving. And the account is that people really stop leaving and start watching what this play is. Right? 
And the play itself then gets taken to many different places. As I said, now um, Machine gets performed still, uh, you know, close to 45 years later, it's still in practice. Uh, and then there's a, one of the other early plays is Audit, a woman. And this is an interesting one because I think machine, uh, surveillance, police, uh, those kinds of themes are very sort of um, canonically uh, socialist, if you will, or left progressive. Audit is a more allegorical play. It starts with a poem, and maybe we'll see a clip of it, which is a translation of an Iranian woman uh, who writes this poem called I Am a Woman. And the Iranian poet then gets translated into Hindi, and that starts the play. It's very lyrical. And then it is scenes from different uh, sort of uh, stages of a woman's life in India. Right? As a child and her right to education, when she goes older, the pressures to uh, drop out of education and get married, the pressures to getting married, to the, uh, the uneven burden of um, sort of gender duties within the household, to does she have a right to earn a living or not? And what are her paths to sustenance and self-independence? Sort of, uh, so again, Aurath is, is slightly longer, but it's been a play that uh, is still done. And I think, you know, in some senses, those themes are very sadly still, if we talk about sort of gendered uh, roles, recognizable and pertinent. Uh, then this is uh, at the same sort of time, there were other companies, and I will talk about this stream of theater, but one of the other ones was in the 80s. Uh, they're called Theater Union. And they were deliberately, actually, uh, very feminist in their, um, it was uh, in, in the kinds of plays they took up. And this is part of the second um, essay you read. The 80s was a very interesting period for sort of uh, not just political theater, but really the women's movement in India. And there are a series of laws, the new anti-Sati law, the anti-dowry law, uh you know all kinds of laws about women and women's rights get written in the 80s uh and so this was a play about uh widow burning right it was really this practice where uh there were two sorts of things happening one was there was one case of an actual widow Rup Ganwar, who was young and burned in the funeral pyre of her husband and claimed to be sati which is an ancient hindu practice uh, with a very very complicated history uh, and then there was the others of dowry deaths which is this you know again it's i think a somewhat um unique to india classification but the system of the bride bringing in a dowry and you know, in the 80s, this came under critical scrutiny, A, because dowry had been banned for all practical purposes, but it was still practiced. But there were all of these mysterious household accidents of young brides. And it really became this thing where now there is a law of any suspicious death, either suicide or um, suspected otherwise, of a young bride will be investigated because the practice really uh was or the crime really was that there were all of these women who were either pressured by their um you know in-laws in the family for not bringing in enough money and that mental duress led to sort of them ending their lives or there were actual sort of uh criminal um sort of uh, cases where there were very suspicious circumstances for death right so these plays are talking about that moment and you sort of see some of this they're on the streets as you can see though i mean if you're performing in the streets in india they're always kids they'll come first they'll perform the circle but it's a very mixed audience and they're listening to plays about what these new laws are why we should support them uh what these practices are uh 
and broadly, these are through sort of time. Um, when you're talking about street theater, as I said, you're talking about streets, but often the street is not as we imagine it, which is not a paved surface with traffic on it. It can often be unconstructed. It can be sort of, you know, uh, ad hoc. It might sometimes be a market, sometimes a street. It can uh, have lines for water or the weekly bazaar or something else. So these are just some of the sort of uh, environmental aspects of where these kinds of plays have been performed. Um, on the top left, this is really fun. This was in a place called Rajasthan where it's a desert. So they, they were addressing um, sort of camel owners. And what you see as the stage is really a bunch of camel carts sort of pushed together to form this stage. The top right is what will happen in most places where the audience really and, you know, this is a pre COVID world. And now when I look at these photos, like I, it's it's just an act of imagination to try and conjure this. But it really the audience is it becomes a very conventional theater in the round. If you have all the space, everybody will sort of push in and you'll have this periphery and everybody will sort of keep trying to jostle. But it sort of naturally will form a very tight circle in the round. Sometimes there are um, aspects like on the bottom left, you know, there's there's a wall and you use that as the backdrop, but you'll have people sitting on top and you really can't predict where and how audiences find their vantage point, right? You can sometimes, like in the bottom right, use certain features. Like if there is a raised platform, you're like, okay, this is a great spot. But part of it is just using the city or using the street as your backdrop and trusting that the audience will find its way to viewing what you are showing them. Uh, this is another one. And this is, again, just to give you a sense of the density. And you really see, you know, if you look at the like absolute top right of that photo, that's a tea stall. And there are people, you know, they have cycles, they're going on their sort of uh, work and their daily business. There might be some, you know, the initial setup of a platform and some uh, rugs on the ground for people to sit on. But it is very ad hoc and it is very pedestrian. There really is a lot of movement in and out. Most of the time you don't have even like basic light and sound equipment for amplification because electricity is... Um, you know, unreliable or source where you can pull electricity for, from. Uh, this was another play which was, uh, I thought, I felt uh, was interesting to include because it's Arthana, though, the primal scream. It's about child sexual abuse and child sexual abuse that happens in the household. That's an extremely difficult topic to bring to the streets, right? Even now we couch it in so much sort of uh, either sort of narratives of shame or trauma or privacy. And we really aren't supposed to talk about these things in public, right? But imagine t trying to stage a play about child sexual abuse on the streets where you have absolutely no control over who is watching it and how they might react to something that's deeply sensitive like this. Uh, this is another, again, to, to think of space. It's an interesting one where this was an old mine and you see the mine cart and you see the tracks for the trolley. Uh, and, you know, that's the stage and you sort of expect interruptions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you also, you have to sometimes time it for shift change. So here you can see that some people still have their helmets on. They've obviously just come off a shift, but there will be others going in. Um, and this is, you know, a more conventional, this is outside a bank and you time it for the lunch break. And uh, these are sort of bank employees of the central uh, bank. And uh, you do the play there. This was a play, by the way, that is, uh, it's a, sort of uh, a play on agriculture. And this was in the early 2000s. 
uh, about seeds and people, how they had been, you know, indigenous seeds were being overrun by these new uh, GMO seeds and sort of the right to food. And uh, not only are the seeds new, but then to kill the sort of, uh, you had to use foreign pesticides now to kill the sort of blights that these seeds were seeing. So there was this whole sort of ecological argument there about what is happening in the farming industry. And then these are the more conventional. Sometimes they're actually tied to political parties and India uh, has sort of left labor parties still. Uh, and so sometimes some of these are performed in support of a local rally or something else. Uh, so here you can't see it, but it says C2 on the flags, which is the central um, trade union organization of India. Uh, and this, you might have read, uh, well, actually, you didn't read exactly this section, but while we are talking about space and access to space and reclamation of space, we all intuitively and I think, you know, often very viscerally know that space is not actually ever free. It is extremely policed. It is, you know, hierarchized and who can be at which space at what time. It is very often gendered. And so the story with Safdar Hashmi goes that you read the 10 years of street theater piece and, you know, they're developing this, they're performing it everywhere, this, that, and the other. On, uh, on January 1st, 1989, they take one of their plays and go perform it at these factory gates. And the factory there had been on strike. And they're really very three very simple demands. Uh, we want a spot to heat our lunch we want uh, bicycle stands and we want regularized breaks okay. uh, and so this is sort of a uh, fairly conventional you know labor strike there are demands this is between the factory and the factory owners and Janam shows up and it has a play that loosely addresses these themes called Halla Bol and they're performing it uh, in front of the you know um, the picket line uh, and these people show up and start trying to disperse the crowd and they're obviously hired goons and they're like beating everybody up in sight and while it's not planned they go after this theater group because they're obviously a source of this disruption and congregation and as a result of that the theater company scatters and Safdar gets into Safdar Hashmi who started the company gets into this kerfuffle and he gets beaten up and the next day, he dies as a result of his injuries. And instantly, this becomes, Safdar Hashmi's name becomes sort of synonymous in India, at least, even now, with issues of artistic freedom, right? And not just issues, but it's a really visceral example of the stakes of space. Right here was the street theater company just doing a play, and you know they're they're not sort of they're not violent in any way. They're not instigating any conf uh, confrontation, um, but you know because of these uncontrollable sort of forces of who has rights to the streets, it can become very violently confrontational. Right, Safdar is an extreme example of it ending in uh, death. But there have obviously been many, many examples of violent disruptions of people getting beaten up, people getting sort of uh, shoot out of spaces, sometimes people are arrested. And we see a legacy of those tactics of disruption into 2021, right, globally. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But what has happened since is that, um, so this was on 1st January, 1989. The company went back to that exact spot in on 4th January, three, two days after his death, with, you know, massive, massive, massive public support. Uh, people from Delhi sort of showed up and they finished the play that, that had been disrupted. And since then, on 1st January, this is kind of a, commemor uh, a commemoration of his death. 
uh, there was also in that mob a uh, worker, Ram Bahadur, was shot. So there's this memorial every year at the site of this, uh, of his killing and Ram Bahadur's death. Uh, where they go back and do plays and ha invite people to give speeches. The local trade union is very involved in these. Uh, and, oh, we saw this already. And yeah, this is this is just one I included for fun, which is that you really can't predict who's in the audience, right? Uh, including animals. Uh, I was an actor with this company for, I want to say, two and a half years. And uh, actively, and I, you know, sort of, I still consider myself a diasporic part of it. Uh, I go back and I um, have very fond and close ties with everyone, but I actively was involved in performances for about two and a half years. And just from my personal experience, I can tell you dogs, cats, pigs, uh, cows, children, uh, noisemakers, right? You really, I, I just remember once, uh, and my director still laughs, um, I was in the middle of some very serious scene and there was this loud blare from like a temple which is like this little truck kind of a thing and i just couldn't stop laughing <laughs> you know the, the audience is you're really right up there and like it's so hard to sort of be in the moment but i think that's also the you know the joyful disruption while we talk about the violent disruptions and the aggression there's also this joyful immediacy to street theater that you can really try and tap into and if you're really really skilled you can use that moment of disruption to your advantage right um sorry there's some okay and then so we come to this other so that is one trajectory and this is the one that i'm most familiar with because i was a part of it uh was is this one theater company but my own research has grown more and more along the lines of also sort of feminist and other sort of performances and tactics that are used in popular protest, right? And um, as I talked about, the 1980s was this really this interesting moment for Indian theater in terms of the laws. But if you read my piece, this is a recurring trope and i hesitate to say problem of indian performance but there has to be an entanglement with the law what is the law how do we change the law is the law just or not or if it is a good law does it get implemented as such and there's this peculiar sort of uh really um reckoning with the legal status right and i have many theories for why this is but why in the global south the law holds such uh, sort of centrality in our political discourse uh, i mean one obvious answer is because the early versions of all of our legal systems are deeply colonial right and so to undo those legacies of colonial laws and designations and who gets classified as a criminal and what acts rise to the cognizance of uh, illegality, these are all deeply, deeply contested. But in a country that is as vast as India and also as, um, you know, deeply fragmented, the constitution is in some senses the only sense-making mechanism for every citizen right whether you're dalit whether you're a woman whether you're indigenous whether uh you are of a minority religion right you are wrangling so many different identities and peoples and traditions that sometimes the only uniform thing it's not language it's not history it's not culture it's not food the only thing that binds you together and recognizes you as an Indian citizen is the law. So this, as I said, was sort of the dowry deaths and uh, plays around that in the 80s. And then we see versions of this now really amongst young activists everywhere. And this was, uh, you know, slut walk, which is really, and there are many, many sort of um, offshoots of these kinds of movements. 
uh, where there was a movement called Pinjrato, which was a, they're a wonderful, wonderful group out of Delhi University, which really talks about, um, you know, really young college students and the deeply gendered ways in which rules and regulations are applied. Uh, if you're in a hostel, for instance, right? Like I lived in a hostel in Delhi University. I had a curfew, none of them ended. Um, the sort of, again, disciplinary actions, the kind of safety issues. And remember that some of these, you might, um, might be a little bit before your time, but you might know of this. In 2011, Delhi had this very public and problematic uh, rape case called the Nirbhaya case, um, which was really this young woman who she and her friend were going to see a movie at six o'clock in the evening and they're returning at nine which is not particularly late and they think they get on a bus but it turns out it's this group of men who've just sort of commandeered a sort of off license bus and they were on a joyride and um, I'm sorry I should say this is sort of comes with a content warning for sexual assaults um, but this um, there, the, 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 there is a violent sexual assault on her. And then she sort of is in the hospital for days and then dies. And that sparked a movement, a mass movement, not just in Delhi, but across cities in India about can women safely be on the streets? How do you reclaim the streets? Uh, there was a lot of talk, and it continues, sadly, um, on sort of Delhi got this sort of very uh, nefarious designation as the rape capital of India. And there's, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether it's the reportage that's gone up or have the actual incidents gone up or do we have like records now? And so we're able to sort of publicize these sort of um, assault cases. But the the the. the I think the fundamental idea that this idea of public safety or women's safety and the safety of certain kinds of bodies or all different kinds of bodies in public space is really uh, this, you know, rehearsal of the idea of who has who has the right to the city. Um, slut walk, this is, uh, and again, as I said, my work has moved more and more into sort of comparative frameworks. There, there are all kinds of sort of transnational movements. Uh, this was very much um, a, uh, in conjunction with sort of similar things in the U.S. and other places. Uh, we see these... Sure. Um, I just wanted to say that it's been more than 45 minutes just because. Okay, thank you. This is great. So I will, what I will briefly do is just run through the rest of my slides and hopefully you will ask me questions about these, right? Because I see these same tactics of political performance, of reclaiming space, of democratizing access in current political movements. One of the big ones was repealing Article 377, which was the really anti-sodomy law, right, uh, which became the sort of criminalizing homosexuality. And this is ongoing. It is, It has been repealed, but as of last two weeks ago, sort of uh, a local court sort of again said, no, the family is sort of constitutive as the heterosexual family. So its status is uh, sort of shifting. And this you might have heard, again, I want you to sort of remark on the recurrence of legal reference points in uh, contemporary protests. And this was Shaheen Bag, which lasted about, I want to say, more than 40 days. But it was uh, women, really, but a group of people coming to sit, physically occupy this bag, this park which was called Shaheen Bagh, and there were a lot of women. And these were against the Anti-Citizenship Amendment Act and the National Registry of Citizens that the new, um, not so new now, BJP government was proposing. And overwhelmingly, both of these moves were seen as specifically anti-Muslim, but also anti-minority 
in India, right? So Shaheen Bagh was uh, one of the long sort of uh, protests uh, against that. And it's a little bit unfortunate because A, Delhi winter ended it. B, it was right sort of at the cusp of the pandemic becoming a problem and lockdowns. Um, but very much focused on, again, you will see images of women and think back to the images you've seen of plays and other things in the 1980s. It's a similar kind of iconography up until 2020, right? And the latest one, this I will leave you to research, is the farmers' protest. And yesterday was maybe the 100th day of the farmers' protests in Delhi. Again, it is entirely a spatial phenomenon. The farmers are occupying the borders, right? Tikri border or something else border. They're literally at the ramparts of what is Delhi city and they're blockaded off there. And you will see visuals of physical blockades and they're occupying the periphery of the city. This is a you know direct spatialization of who has a right to be where. And the city sort of protects its center, which is the administrative and political hub. But the people are sort of spread out. Again, uh, the recurrence of the iconography of women and their participation, uh, this, you know, I, I, I'm just struck by the remarkable consistency of, you know, uh, 1940s, someone on a truck with the raised fist, a woman, and 2021, a similar kind of image of women on the um, sort of Time magazine cover. But again, I, just to end with, as you research the farm farmers' protest and what whatever you might know of it, it is directly in response to a proposed farmers' bill, right? Again, a legal definition, a legal uh, statute that is being contested, right? The, it, it is not. It, it has, or you could interpret many strains of this as you know environmental activism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera who grows our food, who has the rights to uh, grow food or economic arguments of food distribution or how do you organize the agricultural sector, et cetera, et cetera. Those are broader discussions, but the premise of the protests is the farm bill, just like the premise of the Shaheen Bagh protests was the citizenship amendment and the citizen uh, registry. So with that, I am, as Shruti very helpfully pointed out, uh, been talking for too long. I would love to hear your thoughts and just feel free to ask me questions. I will quickly look over the chat now if there is. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. That was amazing. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, you know, a lot of people talk about, right, like sort of, um, they really see Shaheen Bag as one of the um, like protests that have been like, you know, if Shaheen Bag hadn't been successful, then the farmers protests, you know, like would not be where they are today, uh, which is just like, you know, really amazing. And I think that um, I can't remember where it was like, you know, at the same time as Shaheen Bag, but I don't the thing there was um, a similar uh, trade union in, I want to say Bangalore, uh, you know, with an H&M factory, um, like, you know, sort of sent, like, you know, not wanting to take the clothes and then these workers weren't getting paid and it was mostly women who went on this, uh, like, you know, strike um, uh, action. Um, and that was also like, you know, very big and I think similar timeline um, as Shaheen Bagh. But I think that like, you know, um, I, I guess like, you know, you didn't have like, you know, enough time to touch on it, but how important like, you know, cultural expressions are in also like keeping up morale at these protests. Like, you know, there've been so many videos all over social media of people singing, you know, a lot of like IPTA songs, but also just like, you know, from like Bollywood songs um, that have been co-opted and, um, yeah, I just like, you know, I mean, if you want to like talk about that a little bit, any like, you know, sort of real like um, cultural markers that have really struck out to you. Um, also, maybe in relation to student protests, because like, you know, street theater is still very much like, you know, like, like part and parcel of any student protest that seems to break out in songs and especially IPTA songs. So. So there's several strains in there, and you're right, like I could, you know, obviously talk for days about this. Um, but one is, what do cultural forms do? And this is the fundamental of my research. What do cultural forms do within the broader landscape of protest? 
right? We all we are all familiar with and we know anecdotally of sort of a range of strategies from speeches to pamphlets to canvassing to signature campaigns uh, to all kinds of ways in which you mobilize people to your cause, whatever your cause is, right? Uh, within that, I think social media now and our potential for the immediate broadcasting of our sort of, uh, including, as you said, right, like we have Facebook pages and we have other things that, that uh, how do we grow our audiences? We are all familiar with some versions of social media engagement. Cultural forms A, so my first, if I had to really crystallize it, A, cultural forms don't exist in a vacuum. They have to address the context from which they arise and often, or if you ask me, always, speak to the political context from which they're arising, right? Uh, what language is it in? What clothes are people wearing? What are the kind of visual sort of patterns of a particular protest? Um, who are the main characters or speakers or actors? Uh, as you said, songs are often something that pe everybody knows. To me, these are theatrical, right? Uh, I'm trying to think. I, 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 off the top of my head, I can't think of a UK example. But if you recently, if you looked at the sort of uh, anti-abortion and the women's rights movements of Argentina, it was the color green. In the US, if you looked at the Women's March of 2017, it was the pink pussy hats. In uh, India, it was in Shaheen Bagh, it was the dadis or the grandmothers who were sort of in the visual imaginary of, of the representation of these. You are using a theatrical or a cultural sort of um, tactic of visualizing protest, right? How are the ways in which you create sort of solidarity? How do you create collaboration, et cetera, et cetera? So those kinds of tactics are very sort of deliberately take from cultural forms. Another one, signage. I didn't, I have, you know, like, again, hours and hours of um, slides on these, but signs are different protests, right? And now you will see because of social media, if you search hashtag whatever, and there's a whole separate discussion on hashtag activism, but if you search, you will often see the same sign in the US at a Black Lives Matter protest against police brutality and in Delhi, against Delhi police, right? And it's the same kind of sort of uh, ecosphere, if you will, of, of thinking about um, cultural forms of resistance. And so these strategies circulate and they're citational. People will use them from one place to another. And uh, to me, cultural forms are always politically indexed in um, how they happen. And the larger question, and we are living in this strange world, including our current discussion, right, of um, technological congregations, if you will, right? We are on Zoom. And obviously I am not one to dismiss it as, oh, you know, technology and that's not real or that's not, the, it's a substitute for the real world. I don't think so at all. I think real substantive work happens now, particularly in a pandemic world, but even before that on virtual platforms. But I will say that my own research has more and more and more been intrigued by the fact that we still go back to a reclamation of physical space as a strategy. Right? In the US, we saw this as Occupy Wall Street in 2011, and then there were versions of it as Occupy Hong Kong, Occupy you know, college campuses. Um, but this idea that to visualize protest it is not enough to simply be uh, sort of virtual or to be fragmented. There is something about the immediacy of occupying actual physical space in a protest, in a uh, you know cultural event, in something else. That that why is it that that is still fifty year period, seventy year period of my own research, but really through time, why is that the motif? 
that we return to. Yeah, and that's also very interesting because I think, especially with the India protests and like, you know, others as well, but um, the government tried to sort of like, you know, um, restrict internet access, you know, in those areas while those protests were going on so that there couldn't be social media proliferation, but, you know, it, like, you know, they didn't have to be because they were still occupying that space. And I think it was during Republic Day, um, you know, with like, you know, foreign dignitaries coming and like, you know, this real, like, you know, nationalist pageantry that happens in like, you know, Delhi and all over the country at that time of year, um, you know, was really like, you know, being restricted because they couldn't exactly like, you know, there was this sense of like, you know, this protest going on. And at the same time, you're supposed to like, you know, like gloss over that by just like, you know, this um, like march by the army. Mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, no, I mean, I was just like, you know, going to say, and also like, you know, with the legislative thing, like, you know, I mean, um, like this is a it's sort of like different thing, but like still related to, I guess, like even CANRC um, is, um, you know, like, sort of like Kashmir um, and, you know, like the appeal of spe special status in Kashmir um, that, uh, and, you know, it has been like, you know, cultural motives and like, you know, use of theater um, and even like, you know, in film, like, you know, Kashmir is something that is so like, you know, um, almost like the contestation over Kashmir is something that is like become central to um, like, you know, cultural movements in India. And it's something that everyone's talking about, or at least alluding to, even if they can't directly speak to it. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget, and this is, again, sort of my premise, uh, uh, you can crystallize the world's conflicts or the deepest conflicts, or the longest standing conflicts on a fight over space and who has, who can be in a certain territory, what the designation is of that territory, uh, who lives there, how, several things in the things you're bringing up, but I want to point to, again, the farmers protest in India currently is entering its hundredth day or, or just surpassed it. But sitting here in the US, and I wonder if the UK experience of this is different, it became talked about and people were tweeting it, including Greta Thunberg or other people here, Rihanna. Um, it became an international thing when the internet was cut off, right? And it becomes this sort of, it is this peculiar relation of physical space to virtual worlds. The protests have been ongoing, but a certain clamping down on democratic rights of internet access or a space that's uh, sort of, uh, you know, the right to congregate, that is what rises to the level of international outrage, if you will, right? So these in, are- In the UK, it was the Rihanna tweet that really got people to recognize because it wasn't on the news, wasn't spoken about really anywhere. But once Rihanna tweeted about it, mm -hmm. people, that's what people were resharing. And that was the main thing that I noticed anyway, that got people to pay attention to it and the kind of I was thinking of the the other side of it the theater of the them being like the burning of like Greta and um, Rihanna how that was like the other side of the theatrics the political theatrics anyway and you're absolutely right either so strategies don't belong to any one political thought or ideology, right? And that's the point to, is to recognize them as strategies, but, and it's really fascinating that you bring up those, those two, you're exactly right. The burning of the effigies of Rihanna and Greta Thunberg, what is that doing? A, it is mobilizing a Hindu ritualistic religious practice that already exists. We burn effigies at the end of Ram Leela, literally the demon of the Ramayan, Ravan, the demon god at the last day of this Hindu festival gets burnt, right? So it's taking a trope that exists and is still extremely popular, burning effigies. It's using a Hindu religious uh, performance trope and applying it and there in the uk there's guy fox and there's others like this burning of effigies is again sort of culturally has uh, examples in many places but b 
this is what I was talking about earlier, which is it uses a particular punitive imagery of women being burnt. Yeah. Images of women being burnt. Yeah. And again, there are particular resonances of that, whether with sati, whether with dowry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Within the Indian context, there are actual specific cultural re- resonances that, in other places, might not of women's images being burned. Yeah. Yeah, and also, I mean, I guess brings to question, like you know, um, like I, there were like you know men who also sort of retweeted that like you know famous men well known men um and yet it was you know Brianna and Greta Thunberg's images that were picked out you know in that light um and I guess like you know what does that show um also like anyone else in the audience feel free to jump in put it in the chat or anything um yeah and to, to your idea, you know, that it is like other people have spoken out and it's really sort of Greta and uh, Rihanna sort of bear the brunt of it. Uh, the idea that the internet was free or like the liberatory sort of frontier is clearly problematic, right? We know that sort of uh, patterns of misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, they all get replicated and sometimes amplified in a virtual space, right? It's not just that they exist in the physical world, but we see those patterns and clearly sort of the fallout against prominent women spokespersons or political activists is disproportionate. And this is demonstrable or not just disproportionate, but the kinds of threats they face right threats of physical violence threats of assault threats of you know deeply deeply sort of misogynist um violence uh the language is different when they're confronting women activists versus um male activists and also like the realities um you know if you think about like the case of gauri lankesh who was murdered in her own home um you know because of her critical um like you know work as a journalist of the government it's really yeah i mean the stakes are different um when it comes to women um but like you know obviously also when it comes to um like you know like caste identity or especially now um like you know muslim identity um yeah and this is, uh, you know, I, I wonder how much of India's current situation is sort of really a part of your discussions in the UK. Here we're seeing it in some sort of, I'm sorry, this is New York, so there are always sirens. Um, but, but this, we're seeing young activists being thrown in jail. We're seeing students being charged with sedition, right? Uh, again, sort of with with the farmers' protests, but really this has been a tactic of a, not just anybody who dissents, but students who dissent, young women who dissent, sort of uh, political sort of uh, youth leaders um, being criminalized, right? And you're, it's very difficult to sustain and prove charges of sedition, but you are you can be arrested under them and you can be put away for years under them. Uh, and it, that becomes sort of the strategy of containment and censure. Uh, but I think on the flip side, how do you use the power of speech and occupation and protest tactics effectively so that you are able to get a wider audience or greater sympathy for your cause, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that like, you know, uh, in terms of, again, like, you know, I mean, you know, once you point out, I guess, the sort of um, like legislative mentalities that you have, like, you know, I mean, even, you know, like a government that has very much been like, you know, uh, sort of understood to be fascist, um, you know, is still like, you know, goes through parliament, like, you know, with the new sort of um, like anti-terrorist laws that they have used to, you know, arrest student activists, but also like, you know, other left-wing activists and progressive activists, um, you know, they still go through it in these courts and it's the courts that they try and co-opt at first, like, you know, and put in these conservative justices who bring out these conservative sort of legislation um, or judgments um, 
you know, that really consolidate the state. And that's interesting because, um, you know, you really see, I guess, like, you know, almost um, the structural like organization. And I mean, I guess this brings us like, you know, I mean, maybe to a question of like RSS influence, you know, that is such an effective like paramilitary organization. And it has been, you know, like, growing its numbers for years, but yet so like, you know, like hidden away. And whether that's also like, you know, part of that sort of liberal complacency that we've had, like, no, it's a fringe group, you know, it doesn't matter. And like, you know, all the like instances of like anti-Muslim violence that we've seen under Congress, you know, and their like soft Hindu positions. So the problem, and, and this is, I hope something that I was sort of indicating in my sort of remarks to you, which is the problem is the status of the law in our political mobilization, right? Uh, in the US, it's a very, again, like I, the, there are versions of this in every country, including Poland, Argentina, you know, Hong Kong, like they're, they're all facing versions of the courts and what happens to the courts in the US, it's a very, you know, numerical battle of how many justices you get on the Supreme Court and you really know which way the court will lean and how it will vote mostly predictively based on, you know, who the justices are and who appointed them. In India, so far, the judicial system has been, I'm not saying it's unimpeachable in the, in the sense that, but it is vast. And you're right that there is, you know, the RSS has had a project and a longer standing, again, like the Modi government has been appointing um, or changing the regulations of how judges get appointed even. And those are sort of different uh, political parties will bring their own agendas to the judicial system, right? But the, but the premise still, and you can contest it and I'm perfectly willing to listen to those contestations, but the premise still is India has an independent judiciary. To me, if you read the Justice Verma Commission reports after the Nirbhaya case, or if you read the language of the judgments when Section 377 was repealed, it is really lofty legalistic language, which is very progressive. When 377 was repealed, one of the justices said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, said, we owe a generational apology to the members of the LGBTQ community in India for the ways in which they've been historically discriminated against. That's very lofty. Yeah, and I mean, if you also consider, I guess, the legal protections given to people who don't identify as like, you know, binary genders as well. Exactly, right? So my point is that the judiciary in India is too vast to characterize one way or the other. We can't say it's wholly conservative, wholly co-opted, wholly you know, proto-fascist or fully progressive and liberal. There's, it just defies characterization. But I think the larger idea is that if you have to think of the Indian citizen who is a citizen? Here is this entity that is granted one vote in a democratic uh, society. And how do you define that? As we're seeing with the Citizenship Amendment Act, it is very literally, right? Show me your papers and then you can be citizen, mm -hmm. even regardless of if you've lived here for generations, right? Or how, do, how will I give you a set of paperwork that will say you are the, a citizen? Uh, or, uh, you know, it, and any of these other laws, we have this peculiar relation to the law where we know it is imperfect. We know it can be changed, right? Um, like changing the status of Kashmir just overnight. You could have, you know, uh, you could wake up on a morning in August and the state that has been a state for 50 years and more is no longer a state but a union territory. So we know that it is sort of, you can, the status of the law is capricious and sort of susceptible to political maneuvering. But at the same time, 
it often get, is the only way to guarantee rights for minority communities, including, you know, Dalits and um, the, as you said, gender non-fluid, Muslims, other minorities, that, that sometimes the legal recourse, recourse is the only sort of cognizable path of action uh, when there's so many other sort of, you know, social hierarchies that are very, very entrenched and problematic. That's, um, that, that's really interesting um, because I think like, um, you know, I, in your chapter that um, was part of the reading, um, you talk about how like, you know, you talk about theat theatrical practices in the 80s within these feminist street theater groups um, or feminist street theater groups. Um, and you talk about, I guess, like, you know, their use of like legislation and like their invocation of legislation to really point towards um, how uh, like, you know, archaic practices like you know hide behind tradition when they're really almost these, you know, terrible, like violent acts. Um, but I mean, I guess like, you know, um, I, like, you know, you also like end that chapter with talking about um, disillusionment with these legislative um, bodies um, and like, you know, justice not being carried out in the way that like, you know, um, like women and like women activists had hoped. Um, and like, you know, in like, you know, in this time when we're really talking so much about abolition um, and, uh, you know, we had a talk last year um, about carceral feminism, um, you know, I guess, like, you know, I'm wondering, like, you know, what are the positions? Because at the same time, there seems to be, like, you know, whenever there's a rape case, there's really a rhetoric of, like, you know, sort of castration or, like, you know, execution and things like that for the perpetrators. Um, and yet, like, you know, um, at the same time, most people who, like, you know, in India, like, you know, like either don't report like you know rape cases or when they do or like you know the police sometimes doesn't take like you know don't report those cases themselves but also like you know the groups who do the work are like these like non-governmental organizations charities activist spaces and even like political parties um and i guess like you know there's this weird contradiction there so um if you could just speak about that a bit so I, I know I had promised video and we ran out of time because I spoke too long, but I'm putting a link in the chat. And this is a theater piece, uh, 20, you know, it performed it. She is, Maya Krishna Rao is the person we see at the center of the circle in the 1980s photos. And this is her work in 2012 to now. And this is a piece which exactly as you're saying, it is uh, in response to the different uh, highly publicized gang rape cases in northern India. And it's simply called a walk. And it is premised on walk with me. I, I should be able to walk. You should walk with me. And this is a you know, female protagonist saying this, if you will. But then she has this entire digression into here are the cases, here are the reportage, this is this, this is that. There are all of these statistics. The, we numb ourselves to the numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in India, as elsewhere, we know that sexual assault is primarily like up, you know, upwards of 95% done by people known to the victim right it's and it's very rarely and those are the ones that often get publicized of the kind where it is a stranger or an outsider so there's always the problem of reporting and who reports and what are the processes of reports but as you're saying it because the stranger danger kind of cases get publicized or the punitive cases of you know either minors very often dalit girls uh, or others, it becomes this public referendum on really punitive justice, right? This is the, we can jail them. It, it, it's actually a little bit disturbing how often sort of uh, the death sentence comes up in these kinds of conversations or castration, chemical castration. There are all kinds of extremely violent language used to counter these extremely violent um, acts, right? Uh, but I think, again, to, we have to kind of clarify our tactics and our 
asks, if you will, in these moments of great sort of political debate, right? Where I, I don't think any kind of feminist or women's or progressive LGBTQI platform wants to lapse into the idea that the only way to punish sexual assault is to further sort of extend the carceral state, right? But how do we deal with then a problem that is both familiar and often personal because these are people known to us and you know, by us and that becomes a cultural problem of changing rape culture to be able to confide in a family member, to be able to confide in friends, to be able to feel safe to report against someone we know. Uh, to not look the other way, to stand in solidarity with um, a sexual assault survivor. These are all sort of cultural sort of problems, which isn't the same as, oh, let's extend the death sentence, right? What, when we say believe women or sort of, you know, other kinds of things, it's about changing the conversation around offenses and violences against women. And to me, those have, you know, not only, but also cultural sort of um, uh, solutions, right? This is why I flagged the, the play Arthanad for you, which was developed in the 90s, talking about child sexual abuse on the streets. But imagine how difficult that is to talk about, you know, child sexual abuse on the streets where you are and, be, and have some kind of a substantive conversation about it which is not just about, oh, jail people and castrate them or put them to death. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're almost to time. So um, unless anyone has any questions, um, any any last questions, uh, we'll end on, we'll end on that. Well, thank you all. This has really been 